Long ago in the ancient land of Israel, darkness and death and depression covered the land. Herod the Great, king over Judea, ruled with a despotic iron fist over the people. Persecution, oppression, heavy taxation covered the populace. Their prayers, the prayers of the people, had hit a concrete ceiling not just for one year, or two years, or 10 years, or 50 years, but for 400 years, the people would go to the temple, they would go to the synagogues, and they would pray, and they would worship, and they would pray, and there would be silence. 400 long years of not hearing a word from God. Darkness, death, and depression covered the land. News flash forward today. Darkness, death, and depression covers our land. The persecution is on the rise of Christians around the world. Anti-Jesus sentiment is popular, not just shushed to the side, but is actually broadcast on the airwaves. Nationally, suicide rates are climbing, depression skyrocketing in statistics. Tragic news came across this week in my desk of a child murdering his own mother. A child. Teens running into schools and shooting their classmates. Parents abusing their children, national unrest, global burgeoning war across the ocean, darkness and death and depression cover the land. And this time of the year, we gather and we hear of the promises of God that Jesus Christ came to be our rescuer, a redeemer, that He'd set all things right and that there be peace on earth. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, though, remarked correctly, there is no peace on earth, I said. This poem long ago. And so when we are confronted with this darkness and death and depression and the fear and anxieties and worries of life well up in our souls, we ask a question that echoes a question from biblical characters many years before How can these things be? How will I know for certain? I need a sign, God. I want to know how this is going to play out. This looks impossible. How is this going to happen? How can these things be? Have you asked how and why questions lately? How can this go on? How long, Lord, have you asked that question? Why? Why does this continue under your auspices? And when those questions press down into our souls and cycle through our minds over and over, we we need to ask two more questions of God's Word. Good questions. So then, when the fear and darkness and death and depression and worry and anxiety cover the land, where should our faith go? And where does that faith lead? Where does that faith lead us? Where should we go with our faith? We begin this series on adoration, and we're going to define in Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2 over the next several weeks that that question and the other question link up to very dynamic, important characters in a story. We're going to dial in on two characters this morning in Luke chapter 1. You can turn with me there. Luke chapter 1, and for 400 years there had been silence. And yet they prayed, and yet they worshipped, 
and there was a husband and a wife who were righteous before God. They weren't righteous by their religious effort. They were righteous by faith, and they lived right before God because God declared them righteous by faith. And they were blameless in keeping God's good law. But they were simple, ordinary people. And God is going to show them that even though in turbulent times when their faith is tested, just like today, in turbulent times their faith is tested, God shows up with His truth. So turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and we will discover the setting and these two characters, husband and wife, and then another important person, so important, another character. And we're going to see this pattern. We're going to see this pattern that lines up from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament and actually for us today. See this pattern here, darkness and doubt. Have you ever struggled with doubt? Yes. Every hand should go up. Darkness and doubt we face darkness or experience darkness or the effects of sin and darkness, have you experienced that? And when that happens, we wonder how long or why or how, right? Darkness and doubt, but then a promise given, and then wondering and waiting, and then promise fulfilled. Darkness and doubt, promise given, wondering and waiting, and promise fulfilled and darkness to dawn. So turn with me to Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 5. Luke has gathered a detailed account in his Luke-Acts compilation of every specific eyewitness accounts, and we're going to see this come out here in Luke chapter 1 as it is all throughout this gospel. In Luke chapter 1, verse 5 and following, are you there? In the days of Herod, king of Judea. Now, there are a number of Herods in the biblical story. There's Herod the Great, this guy, and then there's Herod Antipas and Herod the Tetrarch, and, and, but this is Herod the Great. In the days of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias. Your translation might say Zechariah, same guy. But this is giving you an important entree into what the times looked like. They were turbulent times that test our faith. And certainly what attested Zacharias and Elizabeth's faith, people seeking to live righteous before God, worshiping Him, following Yahweh's way, in spite of the fact that they were ruled by a vindictive, despotic, iron-fisted ruler who was ready for persecution and was a self-interested man, greedy, seeking his own gain, the heavy cloak of taxation and Roman oppression covered the land. Young men were being conscripted into the Roman military. Young women were being carted off and trafficked by the Roman soldiers and others. The tax collectors, even their very own people, had, had gotten into league with the Romans, the system, and all of this going on, darkness, death, and depression in the days of Herod, king of Judea. But there was a priest, Zacharias, of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Zacharias, Zachariah's name meant God has remembered again. God has remembered again. Zakar is the Hebrew word that means to remember, a verb, to remember. God was always calling His people in the Old Testament, to remember. To remember what? God's promises. To remember His faithfulness. To remember what kind of God He is, His steadfast love, full of compassion, abounding in loving kindness and mercy, slow to anger. Zacharias and Elizabeth, it had been 400 years of silence, and but they were living for God. And then... They were both of, the, of a priestly family. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly, verse 6, in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Again, turbulent times test their faith. Fertility, 
Fruitfulness, having children, was a sign of God's blessing. Barrenness was the opposite. And so here is this husband and wife, old age, all their lives, living for God righteously, blamelessly, following the way of Yahweh by faith, recipients of God's grace, and yet she's disgraced by the people because they have no children. Some of you may be experiencing turbulent times, maybe that very thing. You want a child and no child. Maybe your, your family is splintering, relational fractures. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe your kids are running away from God's way. And, and you say, wait a minute. I, I've been following God. I've been praying. I've been worshiping. I've been serving in His church, a part of the family of Christ. And whew, turbulent times test our faith. That's the setting. But... Something shifts. There's a scene here. Now it happened. Now it just so happened. Well, it's not by coincidence, but by God's providence, that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, verse 8, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by casting lots to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside of the hour of the incense offering. This is his big day. Why? Because there were 18,000 priests thereabouts at this time, and they were only selected. And this, you know, back then, it was, they cast lots. It was sort of like us uh, submitting names on slips of paper in a hat, right? And his name was drawn. And if he had done this before, gone into the inner chamber, not the Holy of Holies, but the inner chamber, the holy place, to bring the incense offering, then then they said, oh, well, you've already done that once in your life, so you're not going to do it again. They only got to do it once in their lifetime. This is Zacharias's once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to bring the incense offering into the inner chamber of the temple. This was most likely the evening offering. They would do this sunrise and sunset twice a day, twice a day for 400 years. I did a little bit of math. Here on the screen, 400 years of silence times 730. So twice a day, 365 days a year, that's how many incense offerings per year. That equals 292,000 times this has been done and silence from God. That's faith. When you don't hear anything, when your prayers hit a concrete ceiling for a year or two years or your whole life, and you will still worship. See, Zacharias and Elizabeth were faithful people. They believed in God's faithfulness. And for 400 years, the darkness and waiting and wondering went on. But this is his once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that he'd bring the incense offering in. And this would have been to lift up the prayers of the people who were outside up before God. The prayers of the people were primarily for one thing. Can you guess what it was? It was built on the promise given. What was it? For the Messiah to come. We want a rescuer from oppression, from all that has gone on for 400 years in the intertestamental period. But before that, we want the Messiah. We long for the Messiah. How long? For the prophet, priest, and king, for God to fulfill His covenant to David, that from His line and all the way back to Abraham, that from His seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Lord God, bring the Messiah now. Turbulent times but God's promising Messiah. Now look in verse 11. This is the shift. Turbulent times test our faith, but there's always a however by God's providence. And an angel of the Lord 
that is a messenger of the Lord, sent by the Lord, appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. This is a furnishing there symbolizing the prayers of the people. So he'd been praying for the Messiah to come. And suddenly there's this angel standing right there next to him. And Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, verse 12, and fear gripped him. That would have been anybody's response. If it happened to you today, you would drop to your face. I would drop to my face in fear and whoa. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. The primary petition is what? For a Messiah. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. That was a prayer also. And you will give him the name John, which means God has been gracious. What kind of God is God? Gracious and compassionate. That's what drove Jonah mad. You're going to be gracious and compassionate to the Ninevites? You find this in Exodus and in Numbers and in Isaiah twice. We walked through this in our class this morning. The kind of God, God is gracious and compassionate, pouring out grace upon those who don't deserve mercy and kindness. That's what this baby boy is going to be named. God is gracious. And so the story continues. God has promised a rescuer. You will have joy and gladness, verse 14, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb, set apart. And then there follows five unique facets of John the Baptist's ministry calling, and he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. Not all, but many. He will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him. Who's the him? Jesus, the Messiah. Wait. Wait a minute. Zacharias had him been thinking, wait, you mean the him? Him. The one I was just praying for. In the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You will notice that the first part of it repeats with the fourth one. He will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God and the fourth to turn the hearts of the children back, fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous and the second and the fifth. He will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, and the fifth, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord, preparation. And the third is the center key. It is that he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to do what? To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, the day of the Lord's mercy and grace and power that the Messiah will arrive. God promises a rescuer. In the middle of the turbulent times that test his faith, certainly there is a promise given. And uh, Daryl Bach, professor, wrote a giant book. In fact, actually two volumes just on Luke. I don't know, 1,200 pages on this gospel or more. He said, there's a ministry of reconciliation. Notice that? In the fourth facet of this, he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. Oh, how we need that today, even. And the ministry of preparation, John the Baptist will do. Ministry of reconciliation and ministry of preparation. That this is what God is going to do through His salvation offering, through Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. When Jesus arrives, the promise. But... Here's the wondering and the waiting. Verse 18, Zacharias said to the angel, How will I know this for certain? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Now, Zacharias is a righteous man who's followed Yahweh all his life. He would have certainly been familiar with the story of Abraham and Sarah. 
This sounds familiar, doesn't it? You can look in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17, verses 17 and 18, and you can look at Genesis 18, verses 10 and 11. Abraham's going, how can this be? I'm an old man. And God says, I'm going to do it. And Sarah laughs, actually. (laughs) You don't know. Do you not know how old I am? And God's going to do it. But Zacharias wonders, and, and he's not doubting the existence of God. He's not doubting God's power, but he's focusing on the human obstacle, not the divine power and the promise. God's people are prone to wander by focusing on the human obstacles rather than on God's promises. I do, right? Big decisions or circumstances or challenges or persecution or the darkness, death, and depression. And we focus on the human obstacles rather than on God's power and His promises. And so Gabriel, this angel sent by the Lord, look in verse 19, really Zacharias is asking for a sign. How will I know this for certain? Can you give me a sign? Which is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians also, the Jews ask for signs, the Greeks, Gentiles, search for wisdom, right? The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. I think that got Zacharias' attention. And I have been sent to speak to you by God and to bring you this Good news, the gospel. And look, behold, you should be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place because you do not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. This is a mild rebuke, but it's also an answer to the question. This is going to be a sign. It's going to be a sign for Zacharias and for his wife and all the people, his silence. And so it says in verse 21, the people were waiting for Zacharias and were wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. He would have walked out, and this is the point when he would have given a blessing upon the people, and he can't do it. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when the days of his priestly service were ended, he went back home. After these days, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant and she kept herself in seclusion for five months. There's no specific answer why five months, but someone wrote about this and I think it's probably accurate that if she had been barren her whole life, Maybe she had a miscarriage or two or three. And this is still sometimes what we do. I want people to find out and then something tragic happens. So for five months, seclusion. And she kept herself there saying, this is the way, but she believes, this is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me. The word is grace, to take away my disgrace among men. People may look upon me without favor, but God has looked upon me with favor. Isn't that beautiful? Turbulent times test our faith, but here's the truth. God has promised a rescuer. God has promised a rescuer, and we're looking at his first arrival. Now, we're going through a lot here. Luke chapter 1 is a long chapter. We're not going to get all the way through, but you're going to hear most of it. Now, the second character, verse 26. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. So, Elizabeth is now entering her last trimester to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David. This is important because Jesus would then be a legitimate heir to the throne of David. And the virgin's name, the virgin's name was Mary. And the word there is parthenos, which is unequivocally defining her as somebody who's never had sexual relations. She's a virgin. And coming in, the angel Gabriel, he said to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. If you want to literally translate that, it means grace to you, graced one. 
But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering, what kind of salutation, what kind of greeting is this? The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. God is showing up with His grace to give her a promise. And look, behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus, which means God saves, Yahshua. God gracious, God saves. How? By His grace. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, fulfilling the promise to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Guess what? God always follows through on his promises. No word of God ever fails. God had not forgotten 400 years of prayers hitting the concrete ceiling. Was anything lost on God? No. What kind of circumstances are you going through? And you long for the day when Christ will return and make all things new, his second advent, his arrival as king. And we wonder and wonder and wait. And has God forgotten you? Has God forgotten his promises? Has God lost you on the map of the earth? That was rhetorical, right? No, of course not. And so Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? How can these things be? And she's not doubting in God, but she's wondering how, from a human perspective, this is impossible. God promised the rescuer and the forerunner Truth number two is God proves the impossible is possible by his power. Look, Elizabeth, way beyond childbearing years, is now entering her third trimester. <laughs> and now look what God's going to do with Mary. The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, you, and for that reason, the holy child shall be called the Son of God. This is unpacking important theology that he's fully God and fully man. And if he were not fully God, his sacrifice, his atoning death on the cross would not be sufficient to cover the sins of the whole world. But because he's fully man, he is in our place. And because he's fully God, his sacrifice is sufficient to cover all the sins of the broken world for those who place their faith in him. Fully God, fully man, the Messiah, the one who would sit on David's throne. And here's the truth we don't want to forget, for nothing will be impossible with God, which is to say, no word of God ever fails. What God has promised, he accomplishes. And God accomplishes his extraordinary purposes through ordinary faithful people. God has a promise and a purpose for your life. That's across all time. Does God have a purpose for Dave back there? Yes, he does. Does God have a promise for you and you? And you? If you're in Jesus Christ, God has called you according to his purpose for his glory and for his goodness and power to be displayed through your life. Mary's an ordinary faithful young woman. Zacharias and Elizabeth were ordinary faithful people, but God's going to do something extraordinary, supernatural, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, it's immediate faith and submission here. Behold the bond slave of the Lord. She says, I am the servant of God. I am under you. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. God isn't looking for humanly special people. He's looking for faithful people. And here, the most dramatic demonstration of God's purposes and power, promise, fulfilled, displayed, and a young woman and an old priest and his wife. And this would be fulfilled in the most obscure locations. Nazareth, 
What good can come from Nazareth? And Bethlehem? These little villages, later called cities, they were, they were little places of maybe 400 people. Small little places. God works in small, obscure places to accomplish amazing things. And the most amazing thing, the greatest story ever told, Jesus the rescuer come to save his people from their sins. God is gracious. God saves. God proves the impossible is possible by his power. And the same God who did this is our God today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe that? Maybe you're, you're not sure if you believe that. Maybe you're asking, how can these things be? Can you give me a sign? How will I know for certain? Glad you asked. So Mary visits Elizabeth. Now at this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country to, to a city of Judah. Something has happened. I'm going to go see my relative, and entering the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby John the Baptist leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened? How? How has it happened? See, now here the how has turned into praise a rhetorical question of praise. How has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? Calls him Lord. She believes that God's promise that was given is now being fulfilled in her very sight. <laughs> this is similar to what David prayed in 2 Samuel chapter 7 when God gave the covenant to him. He said, who am I? Who am I? How can this be? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy, and blessed is she who believed. There it is, faith. Turbulent times test our faith, but God has promised the rescuer, and God proves the impossible is possible by his power. And the pattern of God's faithfulness in the past is a promise and a model for the future, and he wants to work out his power in your life as you believe in Jesus the Christ. So, there, there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Mary believes. Elizabeth believes. Zacharias is sitting there silent. But something amazing is going to happen there as a sign to everybody. Maybe your prayers feel like they're hitting a concrete ceiling. Maybe this Christmas you're going to be especially lonely. Maybe your marriage is falling apart. Maybe you would hope to be married. Or maybe, more specifically, your struggle with sin, issues, addiction, or anger, violence, discontentment, greed, envy, gossip, slander, dishonesty, just seems to get the best of you. It seems impossible. Guess what? God loves to accomplish His work when human ability is exhausted. This is why Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble, lowly in heart, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus, this Messiah who's been promised and is on the cusp of being born is a savior for you to save you from your sin to save you from the penalty of sin and to break the power of sin in your life today that you no longer have to be under the dominion captivity and prison to the sin power you can live by god's grace empowered by the holy spirit to walk in god's power that is to walk in the Spirit, so you don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh, 
or the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. You can live in the new life, which is Christ's life lived through you. Christ in, in you, the hope of glory. Do you believe that this morning? Like, it may seem impossible. That's when God loves to accomplish His work. When human ability and possibilities are exhausted, and He proves what's impossible is possible by His power. No matter what you're going through, doesn't mean it's going to be a cure-all for all your problems, but it does mean that your life can be an evidence and a testimony and a miracle of God's power and His grace that God saves and works through ordinary people who put their faith, who believe, who believe. We're calling this series Adoration, but what does that word really mean, adoration? What does that word mean? You know, we say about a little baby or a little baby boy at our home or a little baby girl or maybe baby boy in your home or a granddaughter or grandson. Oh, they're adorable. Okay. Oh, they're so adorable. I adore this one. You, know, you might say, I adore you, honey, to your spouse. She might roll her eyes. I don't know. Show me that you adore me. Well, the word adoration on the screen, you'll see this definition. Adoration, it's an old, old word. The act of paying honor as to a divine being, worship, reverent homage, that is to bow in reverential awe, in loving submission even, fervent and devoted love. So when we sing, oh, come let us adore him, we're not saying, oh, warm fuzzies and sentimental feelings about the cute little baby with chubby cheeks. No, we're saying we bow in submission, just as Mary said, I am a bondservant of the Lord. May you do your will in my life, devoted love and worship on our faces before this Messiah. That's what the word adoration means, adoration. And faith transforms our fear and our trepidation into adoration and exaltation. That's what we discover Mary doing. That's what we hear Zacharias doing. The story unfolds. Zacharias, <laughs> his speech comes back. The baby is born and the the villagers say, well, you're, what, what are you going to name him? And they assume they're going to name him Zacharias because that's his father's name. And, and Elizabeth says, no, his name is going to be John. And they're like, well, you're a woman and you were barren all your life. I don't know. That was a little sanctified imagination there, but she didn't have a big say in this. So they, they go over to, to Zacharias and they say, what are you going to name the child? And he writes on a piece of paper, his name is John. God is gracious. And then his tongue is loosed, he opens up in a shout of adoration. Mary's Magnificat, which is a praise prayer, and Zacharias, he pronounces a praise and prophecy. Because Christ's first advent, his first arrival, also points to his second arrival. Brought together, you're going to see this in both of these praise prayers. And so, now I want you to listen carefully over here as Mary proclaims this praise prayer, her Magnificat. My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has had regard for, his humble service, for the humble state of his bondservant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. And His mercy is to generation after generation toward those who fear Him. He has done mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their hearts. And He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. He has given help to his servant Israel in, re in remembrance of his mercy, just as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. 
Amen. God has remembered again. That's the definition of Zacharias' name. God has remembered again. And so, after his tongue is loosed and all the peoples are standing in amazement, then he launches out in this praise and prophecy. Listen to this proclamation from God through Zacharias. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the prophet, by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall, um, the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give the light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Mm -hmm. This is the word of the Lord. Remember that pattern that we saw at the beginning. Darkness and doubt, promise given, wondering and waiting. For Zacharias, he had been waiting for years, and then he he waited and waited in silence until the baby was born, and then promise fulfilled, John the Baptist is born, and the Messiah is arriving. And we find ourselves today in the wondering and waiting. We look back on Christ's first arrival. We look forward to the fulfillment of Christ's second arrival. Right now, we have the arrival of the Holy Spirit presence, Christ with us right now. But we wonder and we wait and we ask how and why and don't stop believing. Faith moves us. Faith transforms us when we believe. Faith transforms our trepidation into adoration. It moves us to exaltation as we wait on God's promises to be fulfilled because the past proves He is faithful. You can bank on God's promises for the future because the past proves He is faithful. So today, don't stop believing. Keep believing. Three months ago, Frank lost his job. First, he didn't tell his wife. Then eventually, she had to find out. Now, his marriage is crumbling around him. And the financial stress is growing. The uncertainty about the future is overwhelming. They're yelling at each other every day, and the kids run for cover. And Frank has a decision to make. Will he focus on the human obstacles and try to fix all this in his own power? Or what appears to be impossible, will he bring to the God who can do the impossible? Turn to Christ, trust in Christ, and keep believing in the wondering and the waiting when everything looks like it's falling apart in the turbulent times that test his faith. And he makes that decision to trust Christ and God's promises that he will never be left, gone, forgotten. This Christmas, Lydia will spend time with her family, but around that table, one will be missing. Her lifelong partner, her beloved husband is gone. He passed away earlier this year. And she's going to miss him so much. She's going to have moments alone that are going to be long, the wondering and the waiting and the why and the grief and the loss and the pain. And she has a choice to make. Will she turn her eyes again to the hope that this is not the end, that she will see her loved one again, that Christ's promises for the future can 
be trusted because what God has done in the past is proof and a model that He will do what He said He will do and that no word of God ever fails. And she trusts again with fresh faith in Jesus for the future. Jennifer is a single mom with four rambunctious, wonderful kids. And the guy who's no longer in the picture isn't giving any support. And she wonders, working two jobs and the four kids, how is she going to get them Christmas gifts and try to put at least one nice meal together during the holidays for them as a family? And bigger than that, she's wondering, how is this ever going to change? Is this ever going to get better? Is life ever going to be less chaotic? Or is it going to be one paycheck after another paycheck being evaporated and this electric and gas bill over here that's four months overdue and I can't pay it down? Is life ever going to improve at all? How can I love my kids through this? Can I believe in God's promises for me and for my family that He still loves me and that He's with me Not that everything's going to be perfect and easy, but that God's going to still work amazing things out for my good and His glory. And she decides in prayer, I will trust in the Lord for my circumstances. No matter what happens, good or bad, God is with me. What about you today? What about you? Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me And reflect on the truth that God has promised a rescuer who has come and is coming. That God proves the impossible is possible by His power. That the past proves He is faithful so we can trust in Him for the future. That He works through ordinary people to accomplish His extraordinary plans even through you. And maybe today... For the first time, you need to put your total trust in Christ to say, I am not just going to sing, oh, come, let us adore him. I'm going to bow in faith to God, to God's Messiah, this good news that my sins can be erased and that I can experience and receive the new life born again from above. God is inviting you today to believe, to believe, and your faith in Him, flows into adoration, worship, exaltation. 